Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jessica Dubroff? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Jessica Whitney Dubroff was born on May 5, 1988, in Falmouth, Massachusetts. About a year after she was born, her father, Lloyd Dubroff, left her mother, Lisa Hathaway, but both her parents remained active in Jessica's life. Lloyd remarried right away. He was about 52 at this time, and his new wife was 19. The age difference was pronounced, but based on how the story turns out, the maturity level was probably pretty close to equal. When Jessica was six years old, she started taking flying lessons and became excited about aviation. By this time, Jessica lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. When Jessica was seven years old, her father Lloyd came up with the idea of Jessica flying an aircraft from California to Massachusetts and back. He named the project the C-2 Shining Sea Flight and demonstrated an elevated quantity of enthusiasm for it. He ordered baseball caps and t-shirts with a C2 Shining Sea logo on them and contacted the media. The purpose of this project was to make Jessica the youngest person to complete a transcontinental flight. There is no official or widely recognized record for this activity. By this time, the Guinness Book of World Records had already discontinued the youngest pilot category because they did not want to encourage risky behavior. Despite this, Lloyd was influenced by a story about an eight-year-old who had made a transcontinental flight previously. Lloyd wanted to make sure that the trip that Jessica made was completed before she turned eight on May 5, 1996, so she could claim the so-called record. The pressure of this deadline weighed heavily on Lloyd and influenced his decision-making process. Lloyd did not have an airplane, but Jessica's flight instructor, a stockbroker named Joe Reed, agreed to use his 1975 Cessna 177B Cardinal single-engine propeller aircraft. The details of the exciting mission were planned by Lloyd, who did not have a pilot certificate. The trip would involve 51 hours of flight time over the course of eight days with no days off. Several stops were planned for refueling and for sleeping. In addition, in order to visit relatives and meet with the media, Lloyd planned to take a northern route going east and a southern route coming back west. The northern route east involved a higher risk of inclement weather, but Lloyd dismissed these concerns. As I mentioned, Jessica was seven years old. This made her too young to qualify for a student pilot certificate, which has a minimum age of 16. Furthermore, she did not have a medical certificate. The plan was for Joe Reed to be at the controls the entire time, but only operate the aircraft in an emergency. Jessica would be in the front left seat while Joe was in the front right seat. Joe Reed was the pilot in command and responsible for the safe operation of the aircraft. Lloyd was going to ride in the back seat. Another challenge with Jessica as a young pilot trainee was her limited height. A special cushion was put in the front left seat of the Cessna Cardinal to lift Jessica up and position her forward. She needed this in order to see out of the windshield and reach the controls. Three inch extensions for the rudder pedals were added as well, so Jessica could reach them with her feet. Initially, Joe Reed didn't seem too excited about the flight, perhaps believing it was some type of gimmick. He told his wife that it was a non-event for aviation and basically involved flying across the country with a seven-year-old seated next to him. He was being paid his flight instructor rate and compensated for layovers so Joe was happy financially, even if he didn't appreciate the so-called historic nature of the mission. Lloyd, of course, felt differently about the flight. He claimed the magical journey would propel Jessica to the height of a record holder. Despite the ill-advised nature of the mission and the lack of any legitimate recognition for breaking a record, the media took an extreme interest in the C-2 Shining Sea flight. On April 10, 1996, Jessica, Lloyd, and Joe departed from Half Moon Bay, California at 7 a.m. 
and arrived at the Cheyenne Regional Airport in Cheyenne, Wyoming at about 5.30 p.m. They had stopped to refuel twice along the way. Joe operated the controls for part of the trip, so even if this was a legitimate attempt to break a record, Jessica would have been disqualified. After landing, Joe called his wife and told her he was very tired, but excited by all the people who were at the airport showing their support for this incredible flight. A few supporters were holding signs, and the mayor was there. Joe was ecstatic about all the attention he was getting. His opinion of the project changed. In his mind, it was now elevated above its former status as a non-event for aviation. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On April 11, 1996, Jessica, Lloyd, and Joe prepared to take off for the next leg of the journey. Their final destination that day was Fort Wayne, Indiana, with stops to refuel in Nebraska and Illinois. During the preparations, a thunderstorm approached the area. There was heavy rain and the visibility dropped below three miles. Joe Reed was advised by the control tower that only IFR or special VFR operations would be allowed due to the weather. He requested a special VFR clearance, which was granted. After taxiing to the end of the runway, Joe did not bring the plane to a complete stop before taking off at 8.24 a.m. This made people wonder if he completed his checklist. The aircraft departed from runway 30, heading northwest. The plan was to turn east quickly to avoid the approaching thunderstorm. There were many people who witnessed the aircraft taking off. The Cessna Cardinal had low airspeed, low altitude, high pitch attitude, and the wings were wobbling. As it was rolling out of a right turn, it rapidly descended into the ground in a near vertical flight path. The Cessna crashed into a street in a residential neighborhood about 4,000 feet north from the end of runway 30. The nose section and the forward cabin area were crushed. 52-year-old pilot in command, Joe Reed, 7-year-old pilot trainee, Jessica Dubroff, and Jessica's 57-year-old father, Lloyd Dubroff, were all killed in the collision. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. An investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that Joe Reed was handling the flight controls at the time of impact. They believed this based on injuries he sustained, like broken wrists, and the lack of similar injuries to Jessica. Joe failed to maintain sufficient airspeed and stalled the aircraft. The reason for this failure cannot be determined with certainty, but a few factors probably contributed. For example, Joe made a poor decision to take off in an advancing thunderstorm, which featured turbulence, gusty winds, and precipitation. The maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft was 2,500 pounds, yet it weighed 2,596 pounds. And Joe appeared to be fatigued. The weight of the Cessna Cardinal combined with the rain increased the stall speed from 59 miles per hour to 64 miles per hour. The best rate of climb speed decreased from 84 miles per hour to 81 miles per hour. Even though this is not ideal, the airplane should have been able to climb and turn safely. There are many unanswered questions. Was Joe distracted? Was he thinking about all the media coverage? Was Jessica actually handling the controls of the aircraft? Maybe Joe grabbed the controls after it was too late. There's no way to know exactly what happened. I think it is reasonable to believe that Joe was extremely tired based on the many mistakes that he made leading up to takeoff. For example, he started the engine when the nose wheel was still chocked. He read back a radio frequency incorrectly. He failed to acknowledge information from the control tower. He failed to stop at the end of the runway. And he made a mistake when requesting clearance. He tried to request special VFR clearance, but used the term special IFR, which does not exist. He only corrected himself after the control tower indicated there was no such thing as special IFR. Item number two, the idea for the disastrous journey came from Jessica's father, Lloyd. Earlier in his life, he had wanted to be a pilot in the Air Force, but he was rejected due to his height. He was too tall. Lloyd was described as a man who was always looking to make money through extravagant and grandiose methods. He wasn't considered a con artist, but rather an overly enthusiastic, aspiring entrepreneur who was not good at making money. 
Lloyd had declared bankruptcy in 1985. The media attention was a critical component of Lloyd's plan to capture glory. After he was killed, investigators found business cards from radio stations and TV networks in a shirt pocket, as well as multiple slips of paper containing dates and times for TV interviews. Lloyd represented the trip as something his daughter wanted to do. He said, quote, She really does love to fly. This started off as a father-daughter adventure, and it's gotten wonderfully out of hand, unquote. Realistically, I think this was something Lloyd desired in order to live vicariously through his daughter. Item number three, Jessica's mother Lisa was described as a spiritual healer and a squatter. She appeared to have financial difficulties and declared bankruptcy in 1993. Lisa was heavily invested in the New Age movement. She did not allow her children to have any toys, children's books, or watch television. Instead, they had access to adult educational books, musical instruments, and tools, like hammers and nails. During an interview, she mentioned how another daughter of hers, a three-year-old, knew how to cook and use a sharp knife. After Jessica's death, her mother Lisa said, quote, I beg people to let children fly if they want to fly. Clearly, I would want all my children to die in a state of joy. I mean, what more could I ask for? Unquote. There's this sense that any effort for Lisa to win the Mother of the Year award would fly into a bit of a headwind. It's tragic that Jessica was denied items typically made available to children and pushed into a role of being a pilot trainee, which is usually reserved for adults. Jessica was thrust into a world that is not appropriate for children. It sounds like she never really had a chance to be a child. During her last interview at the airport in Cheyenne, Jessica looked exhausted, distracted, and cold. When she was asked about being scared, she stopped talking and looked away from reporters. Jessica may have been surrounded by people physically, but she was completely isolated as far as being protected by responsible adults. Item number four. At the time of his death, Joe Reed had just under 1,500 hours of total pilot flight time, He had never been officially sanctioned for any wrongdoing related to flying, but witnesses said he often executed approaches at his home airport in poor weather conditions. One time he tried to taxi with a tow bar attached to his aircraft. The night before the fatal collision, both Joe and Lloyd were aware of the impending bad weather. Lloyd told someone who offered to let them stay the night in Cheyenne that he needed to beat the storm. Joe readily agreed with this conclusion. Item number five, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Lloyd Dubroff had always been looking for his big break. He wanted to be a famous millionaire. After realizing that Jessica liked flying, he came up with this brilliant plan of breaking an unofficial record that had no legitimate significance. Unfortunately, Lloyd had no idea what he was doing. He assembled an overly ambitious itinerary and scheduled media interviews along the way. Lloyd had created self-imposed pressure based on these interviews. It was never about trying to complete the flight before Jessica's eighth birthday. The trip was scheduled to end on April 17. Even if they lost two weeks due to bad weather and other problems, they would have still made it back to California before May 5. This was always about making the media interviews. Lloyd had an interview scheduled for the evening of April 11 in Indiana, and one for the following evening in Massachusetts. Being in front of the camera was like a drug for Lloyd. He would do anything to get it. When he realized a storm was approaching Cheyenne, he knew that if they did not take off in front of it, the storm would be blocking their path to Indiana. Joe was aware of this too, but by this time, he had bought into the pursuit of fame and glory. This was his big chance to be part of something historic. The men had actually planned to take off in time to get in front of the storm. It was the media interviews on the morning of April 11 that delayed takeoff. The men should have skipped the interviews, but they could not resist. By the time the plane lifted into the air, into the approaching bad weather, another more deadly storm, a proverbial perfect storm, had already formed. It comprised an overloaded aircraft and a tired pilot who was intoxicated on thoughts of grandiosity. Jessica was the victim of two extremely irresponsible men 
who put her in a terrible situation for their own benefit. In my opinion, Joe Reed should bear more of the blame as the pilot in command, but they both knew better. Now moving to my final thoughts. One theory in aviation is that every disaster makes flying a little safer for everyone else because of what is learned from the mistakes. This aviation disaster is no exception. In October 1996, the U.S. Congress passed a law that prohibits a pilot in command from allowing someone without a pilot certificate to manipulate the controls of an airplane if the individual is attempting to set a record. Through this law, Jessica's life and death may save someone else from the endless supply of self-centeredness, grandiosity, and attention-seeking that jeopardizes innocent children all too often. Those are my thoughts on the case of Jessica Dubroff. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.